years back, the very first year of the monastery, one of Ajahn Suat's students took us to a meditation garden on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It was a beautiful spot, very neat trails under the trees, benches surrounded by flowers, spectacular view over the ocean with the sun sparkling on the water. And John Suat took one look at it and said, this is a horrible place to meditate. He says, how are you going to see suffering? This is an important point to think. I think every time that you concerned about looking for the perfect place to meditate. On the one hand, there are certain things you want for comfort and convenience. But if everything is comfortable and everything is convenient, there's nothing to test you. If everything falls in line with your notions of how they should be, there's nothing to test you. And it's in the tests that you develop strengths, the strengths you need. This is why, as we practice, we're on the one hand learning how to develop a sense of ease and a sense of well-being in the meditation as we get to know the breath, get to know the breath energy in the body. Not simply to have a nice place to chill out, but also to give ourselves a foundation for dealing with the difficulties that are bound to arise. I've heard people complain about a John Lee's method of meditation where he focuses on the comfort in the breath, saying that this gets you attached to comfort. But if you don't have a certain sense of well-being, if you don't have a source of well-being to hold on to, it's going to be really difficult to deal with the difficult situations that the breath can't cover, that the breath can't change. The mind needs its strength, it needs a foundation, so that when you're letting go, you're not just letting go out of neurotic fear or hatred or aversion. You're letting go out of understanding. You're letting go because you realize there is something better. You've been holding on to middling pleasures, minor pleasures. And in so doing, you've been missing out on the greater pleasures that come from training the mind. At the same time as you encounter difficult issues in life, areas where you really cannot make a change, where you can't make a difference. You can regard them with more equanimity, because you realize your happiness, your well-being doesn't depend on things being a particular way. And at the same time, you learn some sense of your own limitations, the limitations of the world around you. The human realm is not a perfect place. It is never going to be a perfect place. And this doesn't mean we shouldn't stop trying to improve it where we can, but we should also have a sense that You can't get everything to be the way you want it to be. And it's not just a question of your personal preferences. Sometimes you see other people are suffering, other people are making wrong decisions, and you can't stop it. That's probably one of the hardest parts about living in the human world. There's a lot of injustice, there's a lot of suffering out there, a lot of people making a lot of very unskillful decisions. And sometimes it affects people who are close to us, and that really hurts. But we should also stop and think, well, it's not just people who are close to us who are being harmed by unskillful decisions. It's people all over the world. And this is where you have to develop a certain amount of equanimity. It's not hard-heartedness. It's more a realistic sense of what you're capable of doing, where your energies are well spent. This means equanimity requires wisdom, it requires discernment. It's 
So you can learn how to read a situation. Is this one where you can make a difference, or is it one where you can't? And given the way the Brahma Viharas are set out, starting with goodwill and compassion and empathetic joy before they get to equanimity, the basic message is that you work on your compassion first. You work on your goodwill first. You try to do something when you see there may be a possibility that you can be of help. And it's only when you realize that, okay, you can't. That's when you have to develop equanimity. But it's good to develop equanimity beforehand, have it in reserve. So when we're spreading equanimity to all beings, it doesn't mean that we're just indifferent to all beings. It means that we want to be able to call on equanimity when we need it, even with regard to people who are close to us. Just as we develop goodwill for everybody so that when someone does something really harmful, either to us or to the people around us, people who are close to us, we can still draw on that goodwill because we've been practicing. When someone close to us is ill, suffering, or doing something really foolish, and they won't let us change what's happening, or the situation simply will not let us change what's happening. You want to have equanimity on hand, so it's not a foreign idea. And you don't feel like you're being hard-hearted, and you don't feel like you're being narrow or selfish or indifferent. I was reading the other day about a line from the novel Middlemarch, saying if we could really be keenly aware of all the suffering going on in the world. It would be like a person who can hear the grass grow or hear a squirrel's heartbeat, and we would be killed, George Eliot said, by the roar that lies on the other side of silence. And she goes on to say that most of us, however, even the keenest among us, goes around wadded in stupidity. It's a bracing thought. But then again, how many of us could function if we were listening to every squirrel's heartbeat and hearing the grass grow? We do have to function in this world. It's not just stupidity that wads us. We want to learn how to wad ourselves with equanimity, with wisdom, so that there are areas where we can be of help, where we can make a difference. We're ready to. We're happy to. But we also know that there are limitations on what we can do in this world. This is a very sobering thought. Some people like to hear that there are limitations. It means that they feel it means they don't have to try to make any change, and that's wrong. And other people get really frustrated. So both tendencies have to be looked into. Both the tendencies have to be checked. You have to learn how to teach yourself. You have to educate your feelings. Years back I wrote a, an article for a magazine called Educating Compassion. And before I sent the article in, I was talking to the editor about it, and she was saying, oh, basically teaching people to have more compassion. I said, no, the compassion is there. It's learning how to educate it so that it's wise. When you say that you're compassionate for someone who's sick, or you're compassionate for someone who's who's dying, or compassionate for someone who's going through some other form of suffering. What does it mean to be compassionate? I mean, there are people who would say euthanasia is compassionate. Other people say trying to keep the person alive as long as possible. That's the compassionate way. And you have to look into both extremes, exactly what which of your own fears are getting involved. So that you tend to define compassion in a particular way. If you have a fear of 
your own death. You might want to keep someone else alive as long as possible. If you have a fear of watching someone else suffer, you might want to say, well, just put them out of their misery, i.e. put them, put me out of my misery. And either way, your, your own fear is getting in the way. So you have to look into that, understand that, so you can get beyond your fears and ask yourself, well, what really is the best choice in this situation? And the Buddha would have you, if somebody's sick, the Buddha would have you teach that person the Dharma. The person is beyond being taught. You try to create an environment that, at the very least, they can have a sense of well-being, be mentally encouraged, mentally supported. Because the biggest thing to fear, say if someone is approaching death, is that the person is going to be worried, going to be upset about something, because that tends to veer the mind off into a really bad, bad direction. So you're not trying to speed up the process of death, and you're not trying to keep the person alive artificially. You're trying to train the person in the Dharma. That's the main form of compassion, the ideal expression of compassion. And as for the things you're afraid of, you have to develop equanimity. Equanimity is not easy. But it's helped along by, one, developing a sense of well-being in your own concentration, and two, learning how to look at your own mind. So the mind wants to jump into a particular situation and say, we've got to help it this way or change it that way. You can step back and ask, okay, is that really the wisest thing to do? Or are you just being reactive or operating out of fear? In other words, the best expression of compassion or of equanimity is to get to know your own mind, to see what's motivating you in one particular direction or another. Often we think of our emotions as being a given. This is what I truly feel. This is the way I really feel. This is my identity. We tend to trust our emotions more than our thoughts, perhaps because we know that a lot of our thoughts are just picked up from other people, but somehow we feel that our emotions are innate to us. Well, one. We do pick up emotions from other people, and two, our emotions really are determined by how we think. It's not just a raw feeling in there. It's certain attitudes, certain ideas that, <clears throat> that trigger those feelings. You want to learn how to see that happening. And it's in this process of looking into your mind and really probing like that this, probing like this, this is where genuine insight arises. We hear so much about insight being insight into things that are inconstant or impermanent, stressful or suffering, or not self. And that is one aspect of discernment, but the Buddha teaches many others as well, many other aspects. And it's working your way through those other aspects that you begin to realize exactly where the teachings on inconstancy, stress, and not self really function. This is why it's important that you do probe into your attitudes towards things when you find yourself reacting in one particular way or another. You want to learn how to question it. Try to get the mind as still and as centered as possible, and then from that improved perspective, look into the way the mind is reasoning around its reaction. Ask, well, why do you feel this way? The mind will say, of course I feel this way. Well, no, why? And see if you can get some answers. And then test the answers to see if they really make sense. To see where they're coming from. And if the mind refuses to respond, you say, I'm not going to act on you then. 
if you refuse to explain yourself. Sometimes it's by saying no to a reaction that you find what the rationale is behind it. So insight is not a matter of just imposing the Buddha's insights onto your mind, trying to clone insight from what you've read or what you've heard. It's more a matter of probing and understanding what's going on in your mind. How does the mind function? How does it explain things to itself? How does it justify things to itself? Which explanations are the wisest, which show the most discernment, which are coming not from fear, but are coming from understanding. And it's in this way that you educate your compassion, you educate your equanimity. When you learn how to educate your emotions in this way, you learn an awful lot about how to overcome stress and suffering. You cause yourself less suffering, you cause other people less suffering, and you find that the help that you offer is more effective, more likely to lead to genuine well-being for everybody involved. <laughs>